very much, Diego. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year to you all. Um, what I'll do is I will share the um, keynote presentation uh, that uh, that we're going to do. So I'm going to run through that with everyone. It's going to we're going to do a, a little recap on the uh, uh, webinar that I did last year, which was the part one of the research into the osteopathic lesion, and uh, then we'll go into the sort of uh, mid 20th century uh, research of the osteopathic lesion, which was uh, uh, by Denslow and Core. Denslow really ran sort of uh, uh, sort of started off the um, research that we would kind of uh, think would be more credible today in peer-reviewed journals, and that kind of overlapped with some of uh, uh, Burns's work. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover all that, and then we'll finish off with some um, thoughts that uh, uh, Owen Core had. Uh, Owen Core. Uh, was a really, really important insert researcher in uh, in osteopathy, and uh, he was actually uh, credited as being the credited as being the second great osteopathic philosopher uh, uh, by by some people. Uh, he certainly uh, knew his stuff. Anyway, I will try and share this uh, uh, keynote first of all. Here we go. Share, and then all right, play. Okay, that's great because it means I can't see my notes. So I'll just put them on the iPad. <laughs> so hang on a second, please. That's why I brought this in here because I thought this might happen. Okay, all right. So the osteopathic lesion, a review of the 20th century research part two. Uh, Okay, so the recap from part one was uh, osteopathy was an alternative healthcare system to the treatments of the day rather than a musculoskeletal pain treatment, which is mainly taught at undergraduate level today. Andrew Taylor Still and John Martin Little John were the first to conduct research regarding the pathogenesis of the osteopathic lesion, and they did uh, research in uh, Andrew Taylor Still's backyard on dogs. And then this was uh, developed upon by Carl McConnell, who experimented on several hundred dogs over a six-year period. And uh, with an assistant, dogs were lesioned under anesthesia. So there was, uh, they, once they became reasonably proficient at this, there was no direct tissue damage, and the dogs were then observed uh, from three to 80 days after lesioning before being euthanized, and uh, an autopsy was performed where samples were collected. Oh, I'm back, sorry. So from this, McConnell's conclusions were that the osteopathic lesion is more than a mere effect at the foramen. So uh, in the early days, up to about sort of 1905, um, the effect of the lesion on the nervous system was wasn't really particularly well understood. And McConnell's um, work really, really helped develop this. If you look at some of the old anatomy books, the osteopathic anatomy books, uh, Clark's anatomy particularly, they, he often talks about um, um, how the, the foramen is affecting uh, the, the tissues going through it, which obviously, you know, there is uh, a factor of that, but it would, the, the lesion uh, process was, was actually quite different to that. And, and McConnell, through his dissections and research with, and microscopic uh, uh, work was, was quite clear about that. So initially, there was, when they lesion, put a lesion in, uh, initially there was a physiological disturbance of the muscular, fascial, ligamentous and osseous tissues, which causes interference with normal afferentation to the spinal cord centers, which is more or less permanently maintained by the lack of freedom of the joint movements. This initiates changes to the spinal cord at the level of the segment and to a lesser degree the segments of the cord above and below. Okay, we all know that the spinal cord isn't segmental, but it's, it's actually easier to refer to it as a segment to uh, in relation to the segment of the vertebra. So uh, I do that quite a bit through this. Uh, I, I do realise that it's, it's not actually uh, segmented. <laughs> 
Uh, this interference to the constant afferent feedback system disturbs function of vasomotor and other centers. Uh, vessel dilation and congestion is a prominent feature. The arterioles, capillaries and veins are pathologically affected by the disturbed innervation. The bloodstream is slowed, the endothelial tissue compromised and plasma exudation takes place. This is followed by diapodesis. Remember, diapodesis isn't a, uh, is a pathological change. It's where the, uh, um, the blood vessel becomes more transpa transparent, uh, more porous, and uh, blood constituents can seep through into the tissues, and, and, and that's the purpose of it. But it does let red blood cells through as well. But it's really to let white blood cells through for the inflammatory process and for, for healing to start taking place. Uh, so this is followed by diapodesis, leading to small areas of hemorrhage, especially in and around the nerve centers of the cord and ganglia. Thus, nutrition is jeopardized, causing parenchymatous degeneration. Okay, I'm just going to change this. I've got the notes around here. Make it a bit easier. I'm a bit short-sighted, so I can't always see that well. Okay, slide four. Yes. The arterioles, capillaries, and veins are patho path pathologically affected by the disturbed innovation. The bloodstream is slowed, and the end. Of, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I've done. I've done this bit. It was. It was number eight that I was on. The neural tissue is greatly affected, especially the ganglia from the core to the sympathetics and connective tissue, uh, which is richly innervated by blood. And the greatest disturbance seems to be in these nerve centres. So many lesions, if not all. Uh, affect the health of the tissues of the end organs, which are directly related to them neurologically. Therefore, acting as an etiological predisposing or maintaining factor for disease processes. Okay, so the big person in the, the big person, not in geographically or size-wise, the, the Louisa Burns was the dominant osteopathic researcher of the first half of the 20th century, and she rigorously followed, followed the scientific method. I don't know if any of you who watched the uh, um, first webinar we did on that, we went through kind of the processes that she followed and how rigorous uh, that was. So throughout the duration of her research, which was corroborated and repeatable by other researchers, it was done in several other labs around that time as well, so it wasn't just her. Uh, the effect of inducing lesions on the neurologically related tissues uh, followed a common sequel. I she did the same as uh, McConnell, but they they didn't uh, they they perfected the way of putting lesions into small mammals uh, without using anaesthesia. <clears throat> so they looked at the uh, uh, sequelae which uh, followed that, and uh, the summary of these effects were um, initially after lesioning there was a uh, <clears throat> Let's keep catch up with that. There's an initial but brief vasospasm causing ischemia. And there was a, after that, there's fatigue of the reflex, which causes dilation of the arterioles. This is followed by passive congestion, leading to inflammation of the effective affected tissue. The longer term sequelae of this is infiltration of fibrous tissue and hypertension. And the long term outcome effect of this in all areas of the spine was ischemia in the neurologically related tissues and end organs. So this in itself, this in itself doesn't cause pathology, but it does uh, render the tissues unhealthy or in this pre-pathological state, so vulnerable, which makes them susceptible to pathology or just degeneration. So th th this in a nutshell was one of the key components to Steele's osteopathy. Um, which is improving the health of the end tissues and allowing homeostasis to re-establish itself and is a good example of the related principles, which are the inseparable relationship between structure and function. And the body has the capacity to self-heal given the right environment. And that part of recovery is enabled uh, by helping re-establish circulation, which is the of rule of the artery line, which was something along the lines of uh, the rule of the artery is supreme and any obstruction to it marks the day, hour and minute of when disease starts or something like that. <clears throat>
So this is uh, John Stedman Denslow. Now, that little gadget he's using there isn't a 1950s uh, syringe for giving facet joint injections, you'll be pleased to know. It's a thing called the pressure meter, which we will talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> so it's, it's probably uh, inevitable, really, that Denslow would be a pivotal, pivotal figure in osteopathic history uh, and research because he married A.T. Steele's granddaughter through Steele's daughter, Blanche. And from an early age in his career, Denslow realised that uh, there was a need for more scholarly academic research uh, to underpin the profession. Whilst this you know, wasn't new, it was uh, uh, the, the profession never had the financial means to carry research forward, uh, and the financial means wasn't available. Much like much like today, really, it's, it's, it was very difficult to fund it. Denslow also did spend time at Sunny Slopes. Sunny Slopes was uh, Louisa Burns's laboratory, and I think that was in California. <clears throat> so. Denslow initially approached uh, the Carnegie Corporation of New York to start the process of acquiring research funding to establish osteopathy in the world of scholarly medicine. Uh, these initial efforts were unsuccessful, but he made some useful contacts within the medical research field and found the experience helpful as the first application for funds was refused because osteopathy was a bit of a political hot potato even, even back then. There was a lot of... Uh, uh, in, in any kind of uh, political area that osteopathy tried to get involved in or having uh, acts and bills put through, they were always uh, um, had a lot of trouble, had a lot of trouble doing that. Okay. <clears throat> so from this, it was re recommended that Denzo, Denslow meet with a chap called Dr. Alan Gregg, and he was the director of medical sciences at the Rockefeller Foundation, and he was considered a bit of a, bit of a maverick. And so Denslow and a Dr. McBain from the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine met with Dr. Gregg uh, for a, a, what was a, a long lunch. He said he couldn't really meet them at the office, but he's happy to uh, have a several hour long lunch with them somewhere in New York. But he wanted to make it clear that he, uh, before that they came, they came out, that he wasn't going to be able to directly affect it, but he could give them some advice in what direction to go in. So... Dr. Gregg suggested that what they should study would be uh, re to research and publish the basic biological mechanisms of osteopathic theory and methods. So Denslow realised this. No, <coughs> so, sorry. So Denslow realised that to do this research, he had to, not only to be an expert in his field as, as, as an osteopath, um, but that but he also had to be an expert in the research methods that would be used. Uh, and, and what he found was it took about two to three years of additional training for both him and colleagues uh, to become sufficiently skilled in the required techniques to be helpful in the project. But this is quite an interesting kind of statement. This is a Denzelo uh, commented on this some years further down the line, um, because quite often we, we get uh, um, people who try to repeat um, studies that were done by uh, or well, historically, we have had people who've tried to repeat studies done by Denslow and then uh, conclude that they were not repeatable. And usually these uh, um, have used students uh, to uh, do some of the research. So one, the people aren't usually experts in their own field, and then they don't have the uh, expertise in the methodology within this particular uh, uh, research uh, techniques to be so they need to be able to do that otherwise it, it it will fail okay so as a result of making these new scientific contacts Denslow was able to work with several world-renowned scientists who he studied with studied with in uh, for, the, for the next two years and he worked with guys who had worked with uh, Sherrington who uh, in England and uh, you know sort of some years before and that sort of thing so he was, he was Dr Alan Gregg had really sort of connected him very well Okay. <clears throat> Denslow knew that with his palpation skills that he had learned and developed as an osteopath, he could readily find areas of muscles and joints in people's spines whose range of movement and tissue tone was different to other areas, and that these were signs of lesion to the osteopath. <clears throat> this led to a hypothesis that the use of EMG would be an 
would be able to objectify and measure these changes in tissue tone that he could palpate in comparison to what were considered the non-lesioned areas. So due to the new understanding of single motor unit activity in muscle fibres, which wasn't some of Denslow's research, but it was, it was research which was happening at the time in, in that day. So Denslow was able to apply this to the research of, into the osteopathic lesion, as one of the characteristics is a palpable difference in the texture of the tissues which support, protect and move synovial joints. Hence, it was theorised that some of the palpable tissue changes or differences uh, were due to change in reflex muscle contraction. Thus, using EMG, uh, electromyography, uh, it should be possible to demonstrate that the difference in reflex muscle contraction in the lesioned areas versus an absence, an absence of muscle contraction in normal areas. And this hypothesis was found to be sort of uh, not completely correct, but certainly partly correct. <clears throat> okay. So Denslow went to uh, Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine because he had uh, recently started working there as, a, as a, doing his research. And uh, he spoke to them about uh, this and uh, what they actually needed to do the research because it was a, it was a very big investment. And uh, uh, Coxville College of Osteopathic Medicine were, were very keen to be on board with this and they wanted to do uh, the research. Um, so a big investment was made to build new labs and these were fitted with EMG machines and all sorts of electronic amplification equipment, which at the time were relatively state-of-the-art. And they even had a huge array of... Uh, high-tech kit, including a, uh, a Faraday room uh, for the research purposes, which I think is where they um, did the actual studies. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this work was due to be published in 1941 in the Journal of Neurophysiology, which was one of the most prestigious journals of its type in the world. But unfortunately, the editor who supported the work, he really liked the work, uh, but couldn't allow the article to be accepted from an osteopathic institution because of the politics of the time. Uh, and, uh, from what I was saying earlier about osteopathy being a bit of a political hot potato with, with uh, the medical profession. So the Kirksville Research Group was renamed as the Still Memorial Research Trust at Kirksville. Yeah, and using this name, the group was able to publish their research until they were su sufficiently well recognised uh, in the pres prestigious allopathically controlled journals that it became known as the, that the research was from an osteopathic institution. <clears throat> so the initial research design included the selection by palpation of lesioned and non-lesioned areas. So these were KCOM students mainly. Uh, so they palpated the lesioned and non-lesioned areas and one coaxial electrode was inserted into the lesioned area and one into the normal area. So I would much rather have EMG studies done these days because they just stick the pads on with uh, a bit like a tennis machine pad is my understanding of how it is. But in those days, it was a needle that they had to stick on. So that must have been, or stick in. And they did this at, at several different levels sometimes. And so simultaneous recordings were made of the muscle activity and it was found that the lesioned area had a high degree of reflex activity and little or no contraction in the non-lesioned areas. So in this way, they could record an increase in muscle activity in most subjects. And this increased activity could be elicited by a number of stimuli, which are not effective in producing the same action potentials in adjacent or non-lesion segments. So by 1941, the research team had become well-trained electromyographers. However, what they had noticed and found disconcerting was that during the process of getting someone comfortable and more, more relaxed with the help of pillows and sometimes in rather bizarre positions, that the reflex muscle contraction at the lesion would disappear and the EMG differential between the lesion and non-lesion areas were lost. So what you can see with this is that trying to get someone more comfortable, actually putting, them in, putting the lesion in, uh, in a position of ease, and uh, and then you lose the the the, the action potentials in, and contraction in the muscle. Um, <clears throat> some other later osteopaths used this research actually to help develop technique like facilitated positional relief, release, 
Um, I think Mitchell and Jones both used this kind of uh, information to develop their techniques of MET and counter strain as well. So anyway, when the electrodes were inserted and reinserted through a, a non-lesion segment of a paravertebral muscle, the irritation produced a brief flurry of uh, action potentials, uh, which they called insertion potentials. And this lasted sort of for 15 to 30 seconds. However, when the electrodes were inserted and reinserted uh, through muscles in lesion areas, the action potentials continued for long periods. Uh, and when the action potential subsequently died out, moving the electrodes very slightly would reinitiate, reinitiate them, which was a phenomenon that didn't occur in normal areas. So they were, the, the lesion areas were much more uh, likely to, to have contraction in the muscles. At a later stage in the research, it was found that other irritations, I, I stimulation of the skin uh, chemically with drops of ether and mechanically uh, with pin scratches or with pressure on spinous processes initiated contraction in lesion areas but again not in the lesion in the non-lesion areas <clears throat> Denslow and his colleagues found that when a major set of afferent impulses reached a given spinal cord se segment uh, from whatever source one of two things happened at the affected motor nerve cells either the motor cells were activated and the muscle contraction occurred, or the cells were placed in a state of partial or subliminal excitation, which was referred to as a central excitatory state. And this later became known as, it was the thing they called facilitation. When the central excitatory state was present, another set of afferent impulses could be added to the original impulses from the lesion area, and the motor cells supplying the lesion area were then activated by the two sets of stimulus that were ineffective at non-lesion se segments. And this was because the motor nerve cells in the lesion area were already partially excited. So <clears throat> the lesion was causing this excitation. And then if they added another set of stimulus, it would cause a muscle contraction and uh, which they could measure on the EMG, whereas in a non-lesion segment, these two sets of input wouldn't actually cause any muscle contraction, which demonstrated that uh, there was an excitatory ex state already existing in the lesioned area. And this was uh, sort of pioneering work of the uh, for central sensitization in the central nervous system. Okay, so these little diagrams are just sort of taken out of uh, one of uh, the research papers that uh, Denslow did. So in graph A, which is the top left one, um, the patient is voluntarily contracting both areas to show the <coughs> excuse me to show the electrodes were in contact with the muscle. So this is the, A is really just a test one, and you can see the top one is the uh, non-lesioned area and the bottom one is the lesioned area there. In, in graph B, the patient is lying quietly and there's no contraction in the non-lesioned area while a single motor unit is contracting spontaneously in the lesion area, which is uh, the bottom one with the little uh, black lines coming, coming from the bottom of it. <clears throat> in graph C, the patient has been relaxed by bolstering with pillows and there is no contraction in either the lesioned area or the non-lesioned area, as you can see, it's, uh, the lines are pretty pretty quiet there. All the graphs are pretty quiet. Now, in the in the time break between graphs C and D, both areas have been stimulated, either chemically or physically or, or something like that. And following the stimulation, it's shown that in D, that the, the non-lesioned area uh, continued to be relaxed. So the non-lesioned area, which is the upper line, settled down very quickly or, or wasn't didn't actually show any action potentials whereas the lesioned area again shows contraction <clears throat> this work was published in the journal of neurophysiology and the results can be summarized as lesioned areas associated with postural changes or strain commonly show spontaneous action potentials when such spontaneous activity is absent <clears throat> 
it can be induced by suitable stimuli. <clears throat> this is a useful criteria for detecting lesions. So this is one of the ways one of the ways you can use for detecting lesions. Uh, <clears throat> Induced reflex activity is probably dependent on the presence of an enduring sensual excitatory state plus an accessory subliminal stimulus. So there's the sensual excitatory state being caused by the lesion, and then there's some other stimulus which is needed to um, make the nervous system uh, go over the threshold it needs to contract the muscle. So from this, Denslow was able to be the first to objectively measure the effects of the presence of a lesion and publish this in a peer-reviewed journal and was slowly building the biological evidence, which is what Alan Gregg had suggested he did, that there was central sensitization being caused by the lesion process. So as far as I'm aware, this is the first research which was starting to develop um, uh, one facilitation at the dorsal horn there was a, there was a bit a bit known about that already by some of the earlier researchers but not that much earlier but certainly uh, there wasn't so much known about the whole central sensitization process which is what they're starting to uncover here <clears throat> this paper was eventually published in the prestigious as i said this paper was eventually published in the prestigious journal of neurophysiology about the name of the lab had been changed because the, the, the lab was called the Biomechanics Laboratory of the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine, which is a, not too much of a mouthful and a nice snappy little uh, little name. And it was then just called the Still Memorial Research Trust. And this removed the association uh, to osteopathy as it was controversial and most editorial referees were not familiar with the osteopathic profession. So. <clears throat> This is that picture of uh, Denslow again. And uh, what he'd actually developed here was this pressure meter. They went through several stages of developing this, but the, what they, after that paper that was pub published in the Journal of Neurophysiology, what they wanted to do was develop uh, a piece of equipment that was able to apply an objectively measured external stimulus which, and then they could record the amount of stimulus being produced. And this pressure meter was designed that could apply a force from one to seven kilos in one kilo increments. And uh, this is what he's using here with the EMG machine as well. So the earliest version was this large cumbersome device which went through several stages of development. And what they found was that one kilogram of pressure at a lesion site would produce action potentials where seven kilograms of pressure at the non-lesion areas would fail to initiate any contraction at all. When I, around the sort of 1990s, there was um, a, a discussion about this, uh, uh, this work that Denslow had done and, uh, and some criticism about it. And I think the person who was actually doing that didn't really read uh, this paper was that the statement that they made that well if you press hard enough on someone's spine they're bound to get a reflex contraction but this was very carefully measured and uh, as you can see it was uh, uh, a much lower amount of pressure was needed to stimulate uh, reflex thresholds in the lesioned areas as per uh, opposed to the non-lesioned areas so Quite a bit of what I'm going to talk about next isn't actually on the uh, slides, so don't try and uh, don't don't worry about me not keeping up with the pages here, because it's uh, uh, some of this I'm going to going to read to you just from my notes. <clears throat> okay, so this is Erwin Kaur, who's uh, uh, a PhD. Always kind of I was always a little bit uh, unsure how uh, a kind of high flying. Uh, scientist ended up at Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine, which was a relatively unfashionable institution without uh, a huge amount of money or credibility at the time. And uh, he was a rising star in the scientific world. Um, and and I found out from Jason Haxton last year why why this was actually. And uh, he was very kind to 
Um, let's use these pictures as well from the Coatesville College, uh, Coatesville uh, Museum of Osteopathic History or whatever it's called. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so when Cor was an undergraduate physiology student uh, at New York Medical School, he was approached by two students which, who he'd really admired, and they told him that they thought with his mind and attitude, this is pre-Second World War, so this is in the 1930s, and they told him that with his mind and attitude, he should join the Communist Party. And, you know, you can, kind of, you can, you can see where this is going. But at, at the time, um, <clears throat> at the time, uh, uh, he felt the philosophy, the philosophy that he'd had explained to them of the system, that he'd had explained to him of the system, um, it seemed rational. There was no mention of revolution, overthrowing governments, violence or war. Uh, and it was a very acceptable f philosophy about equality among races with no discrimination and that poverty should be outlawed and nobody should be poor or wealthy. And there were lots of other distinguished members of the medical faculty who were also members. So during World War II, the US government, uh, they needed scientists like Core uh, as their technology was behind the European countries uh, and, and, and the other allies. And with his specific skills and previous research, um, he was useful to them. Um, so his background was kind of overlooked because all government employees were, were actually vetted and they, uh, they were quite concerned about uh, people who uh, had that kind of his history uh, to them. And we're not quite ready for that one yet. So after the war, when Core wasn't really needed for that anymore, Senator McCarthy thought that Core was a security threat. And because of his pre-war membership of the Communist Party, his stance as a conscientious objector, objector to World War II and his anti-war uh, statements. But when the war was over and scientists like Core were returning to civilian life, he became too controversial for his own good. And when he applied to many for many academic positions, um, of various institutions who, who wanted to actually employ him, he'd keep getting rejected after meeting with them and they seemed very keen to take him on. And uh, what happened, he'd get a phone call a couple of, a couple of days later saying that they, they couldn't take him on as a scientist because they'd have um, some of their grant money uh, would, be, would be taken away. So uh, Dr. Core was a very well connected young scientist, and he even knew Albert Einstein. Uh, uh, Einstein was professor of maths at Princeton University, uh, where Core did his PhD, and having even played in a musical ensemble with Einstein. And uh, during the World War II period in the US, the anti communist paranoia was being whipped up uh, during the Truman presidency. And uh, the background of every civilian who worked in the government was checked, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. So what came back was that Dr. Core, because of his classification as a security threat, was too controversial and no one wanted to employ him, as I just mentioned. But coincidentally, uh, in 1938, when Denslow had met with Dr. Alan Gregg of the Rockefeller Foundation, remember, he was the guy who made the recommendation for Denslow to um, research the biological processes of, of osteopathy and uh, had met with them for, for a long lunch. Um, he also met with Core at a, after the war, and he told Core uh, that uh, uh, there was a research position available at KCOM and at the Coastal College of Osteopathic Medicine, that is, and that they were, it was really fascinating, the, the research that was coming out of Kirksville at that time, which was the research we'd just been talking about. And so as no one else would employ him, he came to Kirksville because he had a wife and young family and he, and he needed the money. So Core joined KCOM in 1945, but only planned to stay there for a year until, until the heat died down. But he found the research at Kirksville so fascinating that he actually stayed for 30 years. And Core was to play a major role in developing the idea uh, and research into the osteopathic lesion. But from their previous research, the group knew, uh, which included New Boy Corps, that these areas of facilitation existed in the CNS. But what, what was not known uh, was which elements in the spinal reflex accounted for the facilitation or, or sensitization. 
nor did they have any quantitative information concerning how much facilitation might be present. So this is where the pressure meter came in, and they added this to the previous research that they'd, that they'd been doing. So they were, they were following a method, methodological process uh, to, to get to this point. So the following experiment was designed. Recording electrodes were inserted in the paravertebral muscles of Coach Philosophy medical students opposite T4, T6, T8 and T10. These electrodes were connected to an eight-channel EMG and thus it was possible to record simultaneously muscle action potentials that might or might not be present at each recording site. So they could, previously, they, they, I think they'd only had a single channel uh, EMG, so they could only measure really one site at a time, which again made it more cumbersome. The pressure meter was applied at increments of one kilogram until the top level, seven kilograms, was reached without initiating contraction or until contraction was recorded at the segment being stimulated. <clears throat> so they used the pressure meter on the segment until it either contracted or there was no contraction at, at the maximum pressure, which was seven kilograms. So this was a cumbersome and time-consuming process, the setting the pressure meter one, one uh, kilometer, kilometer? One, uh, kilogram intervals and uh, then on to two kilogram and, and through each segment until they uh, had the measurements that they required. And it took quite a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So each segment was palpated prior to stimulation and the absence or presence and degree of lesion, lesion was predicted. So whoever the osteopath was who was uh, palpating the lesion segments um, had to decide what pressure he thought the pressure meter would um, cause a reflex contraction at. So <clears throat> each segment was palpated prior to the stimulation uh, and the absence or presence and degree of lesion was predicted and recorded on the basis of the differences of the supraspinous tissues found during palpation and the pressure meter was set accordingly. The predictions proved to be uh, quite remarkably accurate actually. <clears throat> so in 1947, the results of the research were published in the American Journal of Physiology under the title, another catchy title, Quantitative Studies of Chronic Facilitation in Human Motor Neuron Pools. And the findings they, uh, the findings they made were briefly summarized as, as follows. So reflex threshold. A small stimulus from the pressure meter at the lesion sites caused action, potential, action potentials whereas a large stimulus at a non-lesion site produced little or no muscle contraction. In addition to this, in individuals with both lesioned and non-lesioned areas, stimulus at the non-lesion segments, whilst not causing a local contraction, would cause a muscle contraction at the lesion segment. So they could press a non-lesioned area seg several segments away, and that would affect the lesion area. <clears throat> This occurred even if the supraspinatus tissues at the facilitated segment were initiated with procaine. So it's not because it, just because it was a painful stimulus. They, 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 they wanted to check that. This as, well as, this, as well as other observations, suggested that the facilitation involved the interneurons or motor neurons of the spinal cord or both. Palpation of tissues. When palpated, the tissues of the lesion segments felt thickened or swollen in contrast to those of the non-lesion segments and the bony outlines were harder or more defined. The differences between the tissues were sufficient for an accurate guess of how facilitated the segment was. Experienced examiners were able to guess what pressure would be required to cause reflex muscle contraction from palpating the supraspinous tissues and with an accuracy of 87.5%. And the other 12.5% were only one kilogram pressure wrong or out. So they were, they were very close. You know, it was a, 
And uh, this, you know, this isn't actually you know, that unusual for us, uh, but it's good to see it quantified and, and measured objectively. Thus, an experienced examiner could predict on the basis of a physical examination the absence or presence and degree of spinal cord facilitation. So the palpatory findings were actually a degree of what was happening, uh, a measurement of the degree of what was happening within the spinal cord. And, well, not just the spinal cord, but in the central nervous system. And this provided, uh, again, an important diagnostic evaluation, regardless of the type or location of pathology which accounted for the facilitation. Pain. Application of the pressure meter was usually painful at the lesion segments and, and not painful at the non-lesion segments. After repeated stimulation, the, the spinous processes at facilitated segments frequently remained tender for more than 24 hours. And this tenderness uh, did not occur at, at non-facilitated segments. Uh, their, their comments on the precise nature of this disturbance that accounts for the supraspinatus tissues at facilitated segments were for a supraspinatus, supraspinous. I must have seen too many people with shoulder problems today. Their comments on the precise nature of the disturbance that accounts for the supraspinous tissues at facilitated segments were they have low reflex threshold, can be identifiable on physical examination, and they can be tender. However, since two of the characteristics of inflammation, namely swelling and pain, are involved, it's suspected that this disturbance is similar to a chronic inflammatory process brought about by the lesion process. So the, the lesion was causing edema. So in summary, facilitated segments have a low three reflex threshold. They have tissue changes on palpation. Pressure produces pain and the tissues are susceptible to minor trauma. In the non-facilitated segments or non-sensitized segments, they have a high reflex threshold, so they're not affected by the pressure. There are no tissue changes on palpation, and pressure does not produce pain, and the tissues were not susceptible to minor trauma. So moving from that, we're going to talk about a paper which was called The Neural Basis of the Osteopathic Lesion. So what was initially an idea to process and organise data, uh, or the data that Denslow and Core and the co their colleagues had created by 1947, and review where they, are, where, where they were with their understanding of chronic segmental uh, facilitation or sensitization, this actually developed into a presentation uh, at the American Osteopathic Association conference in July 1947. And this presentation was also published in the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association in December of 1947. We're going to discuss this uh, um, a, a little bit of length, I'm afraid, because it's actually really important. As I said, this paper was called The, uh, the Neural Basis of the Osteopathic Lesion. Okay. And the, the summary of this work was as follows. Excuse me. <clears throat> the osteopathic lesion is associated with a segment of the spinal cord which has a low motor threshold, meaning facilitated or sensitized these days. The lowered motor threshold, which affects the spinous process but isn't caused by the spinous process, even though they can be used as a diagnostic tool, their sensitivity is secondary to the facilitation of the cord structures. This lesion segment can be affected by stimulus at the segment or, or from nearby segments. So this is kind of, again, early days, kind of pain science, if you like, really. Uh, the lesion, therefore, represents a segment on which irritation is focused a place in the cord where inhibition to motor neuron excitation has been lowered, so the uh, descending inhibition, inhibition uh, is, has been affected, and impulses into the muscles and other neurologically related structures are increased, such as organs. There are also other notable features, 
alteration in tissue texture over the spinous process, lowered pain threshold and increased susceptibility to trauma, which you already said. So it was surmised that it was probably that these, these changes in tissue were due to local uh, changes in vasomotor activity, uh, fluid balance, capillary permeability, trophic factors and other features which are directly or indirectly under the influence of the lateral horn cells of the sympathetic nervous system which were affected by the lesion. What was also found was that the tissue texture changes were closely related to the degree of lowered motor reflex threshold, which was how the osteopaths uh, predicted that they would need a, a lower pressure on the pressure meter. <clears throat> Pain threshold was lowered, and it was easier to reach the consciousness of the patient, meaning the CNS really, uh, or the cerebral cortex, uh, through the lesion segment rather than the non-lesion segment. This was interpreted as signifying a facilitation of the spinothalamic fibers. <clears throat> Susceptibility to trauma or mechanical irritation to the lesion segments uh, may stay painful for several days, whereas uh, the same stimulus to a non-lesion segment was soon forgotten. So remember, this is reviewing um, uh, the work that Corwin Denslow and uh, colleagues had previously done. So characteristics of the osteopathic lesion are, in the lesion segment, motor neurons are usually inhibited from firing until a high enough threshold of stimulus facilitation or sensitization, if you like, is reached by the convergence from other neural impulses. This serves to reduce aberrant firing uh, and acts as a kind of insulation from this. So we're talking about a descending modulation uh, here. In the lesion segment, this descending inhibition is weakened and a large, por a large portion of motor neurons are kept near the firing point and therefore are triggered at much lower levels of afferent stimulus so obviously stimulus coming in <clears throat> and that can be from any segmental or neurologically related structure or stimulus by other nearby lesioned or non-lesioned segments proprioceptors are an important source of this bombardment but any segmentally related structure such as a viscera may be a source so the proprioceptors from the, the lesion the bony lesion process and those soft tissues uh, are a factor in um, this as well as uh, some other kind of stress and strain or incoming afferent bombardment from uh, 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 an inflamed viscera. Due to the facilitation, the firing process of a motor neuron at a lesion segment may be completed uh, by, by any or far fewer inputs than a non-lesion segment due to the loss of the inhi inhibiting insulation. So again, this is a uh, talking about the loss of uh, the descending influences of being affected by the lesion process because it's kind of on high alert. The state of facilitation may extend to all of the neurons with their cell bodies in the same segment of the cord related to the lesion, including the anterior horn cells, the preganglionic fibers of the sympathetics, and the spinothalamic fibers. Because the lesion sensitizes the segment to all impulses, from all sources, it should, should be considered as a neurological lens, which causes or focuses irritation on that segment rather than a radiating center of irritation, and therefore should be treated as such. It was not doubted that facilitation in the lesion segment also extends to neurons extending inhibitory influences on other neurons or organs. So they, they had an effect on the other local tissues. So Core hypothesized that assuming the importance of the proprioceptors in the lesion mechanism, it must be kept in mind that any segmentally related structure that sends afferents to the spinal cord may be an important participant, participant in the establishment or maintenance of the lesion. So it wasn't only postural things or trauma, there are other factors which were involved, such as viscera. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
In fact, through the network of interneurons, practically any afferent, segmentally or relate, related or not, may exert some influence. So this could be due to the lack of uh, descending inhibition. To all these sources of impulses must be added that the suprasegmental sources or the or all the higher centers from the badala to the cere cerebral cortex, which contribute to the descending spinal tract motor impulses. Many of these are continuous and highly variable sources of impulses. So he was talking about the effects from the, the, the higher centers here now, which uh, something which uh, Core was said to uh, not involve for some reason, again, probably by someone who hadn't actually read his work. So many of these are continuous and highly various sources of impulses. They exert their influence, excitatory or inhibitory, upon efferent neurons or the motor neurons at every level of the spinal cord, whether it's lesioned or non-lesioned. What Cole was saying here is that we should consider that the efferent motor neurons do act as the final common pathway shared by a host of impulses or impulse sources in addition to the facet joints and their supporting structures. So we're talking again about other incoming stimulus, other stresses, other causes of inflammation, which sending, send impulses into the lesioned area. Because of this, it cannot be considered that the lesion is the cause of a disease, which was hopefully obvious by this point, but uh, um, I think Little John had stated this back in about 1910, that. Uh, uh, a bone out of place didn't cause a disease, uh, but it was one of the many factors happening simultaneously. Uh, and the lesion is, but the lesion is an important factor as it predisposes, localizes, and channels sensitizing segments of the cause and lowering, lowering barriers and facilitates without ne necessarily producing symptoms. So we go back to Burns's work again. What it's actually doing is having an effect on the end tissues. Uh, which then predisposes to them either to, de to degeneration um, or to disease processes, if, if there's other factors involved. Signs of its presence are detected by osteopaths. This is the lesion, signs of its presence. We know we can find lesions. This broadens the importance of the osteopathic lesion and points to how it has an effect on general health and wellness, which is, again, getting back to uh, what's still was doing. So osteopaths for the last 120 odd years we have been familiar with this uh, and to the osteopath uh, there is of course nothing unfamiliar in the practical aspects of this concept. One patient has relatively severe lesions but is uh, symptom and pain free and not readily subject to illness or fatigue or effects of those lesions whereas another patient would face similar lesions may be subject to serious disturbances directly relating to those lesions so that we, we see this in our patients you know some some people seem to be more readily subjected uh, affected by these things than others <clears throat> and so further than this the uh, the lesions in the first patient may become symptomatic under certain circumstances and then subside into remission again so core and his fellow researchers believe that it's implicit in the osteopathic concept that one important basis for the difference between patients who are affected by their lesions and patients who aren't affected by their lesions <clears throat> is the amount of nervous excitation continuously bombarding the efferent neurons uh, of the lesion segment over and above that from the muscles and joints. So if they've got something, what we say, they've got something else going on. <clears throat> Therefore, the lesion operates in, in, in different contexts with different effects or with different, uh, well, the lesion is contextual. So Core went on, I'm afraid. <clears throat> Given that the lesion determines the low threshold segments, then the severity of the lesion and the, associate, the associated pathology and the response to treatment will often depend upon how much neuronal stimulus from other sources is chronically present. This is interesting because it develops into the, something else we're all very familiar with these days, uh, hopefully. Therefore, the, the lesion process uh, not only focuses the effect on the segment of the cord, of the cord uh, but also magnifies any stresses or increased neuronal stimulus by it, made by it. This superimposed stimulus may come from other sources 
which converge on the anterior horn cells and other efferent neurons such as the cortex, the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, vestibular nuclei, uh, bulbar center, and the eyes via tecto, the tectospinal tracts or any other tonic sources of impulses. So what we're talking about is, is people uh, who in anxiety states or hypervigilance or people who worry a lot um, or are in uh, stress, stressful situations. So since all these sources may directly affect either positively or negatively the lesion and its associated phenomena, they're all probably within the remit of probably within the remit of the osteopath. All of them may contribute to the lesion and to its effects on the total body economy. Important as the structural factor is, treatment of it alone is not treating the patient as a whole and would be, if interpreted correctly, a corruption of the osteopathic concept. This is cause, cause words here. Uh, so what he's saying is we have to look at the whole patient, which you know is what little John said uh, back in 1910 again. And uh, it's not just the biomechanical model. The biomechanical model is, uh, or the biomechanical part of it is extremely important. We have to treat that as well, but we have to uh, consider everything. Sorry, so, uh, uh, Robert, is, did you have that a slide? Because we, we're in the, in the, I don't know if you changed the slides or. Uh, okay, no, you were reading. Uh, okay. uh, sorry, sorry, this was a bit that uh, I was just going to be reading. Okay, okay, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so an example of this uh, could be a patient with an anxiety uh, state or going through a stressful situation and the effects uh, of the cortex can increase motor activity so it, with your pre-established beliefs and ideas um, or thoughts can either amplify this or, or, or reduce this so muscle, muscle tone and hyper responses Hyper responsiveness is generally lowered, generally lowered reflex thresholds, and this is due to impulses passing down the descending spinal tracts and affecting directly or through interneurons in the anterior horn cells, and increasing their excitability and activity. In a segment already sensitized by an osteopathic lesion, the effects will be especially severe. And just as important is the fact that descending impulses may exaggerate the lesion and produce increased effects on the segmentally related organs and may cause or intensify pain or make the lesion less responsive to manipulative therapy. To treat only the structural source of the bombardment, is what he said earlier, is only to half treat and neglect the most important part of the lesion mechanism and to take the lesion out of context. This does not mean that every osteopath has to be a psychiatrist, uh, but they certainly must take into consideration the home factors, environmental factors, family relations, emotional adjustments, tensions, etc. Uh, you know, this, so this is uh, what he's saying here is um, what people talk about now as the biopsychosocial uh, thing. So this this was in 1947. So uh, this was uh, you know this 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 thought. And belief within osteopathy isn't, isn't a new thing. It's been around for a long time. We just have to make sure people are taught it and, it, and it's applied. Uh, and Little John uh, was, was doing this in 1910. So it's not new. Uh, the connection between these states of stress and manifestations of pathologies such as angina, gastric and duodenal ulcers, asthma, etc., is the, the connection between these two things is the autonomic nervous system and anything that directs, focuses or channels changes in blood flow or function uh, to an end tissue may predispose towards pathology. And this is what the, what the lesion does. One of the things that CORE has been criticised for is for not involving the highest CNS. So again, people who haven't read his work, they said, oh, well, he didn't involve the, 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 the higher centres. But he did. You know, this, is a, this is all from CORE's 1947 uh, work. You know, they didn't have functional MRI then, where they could see areas of sensitization, but they realised that uh, you know that the uh, input and output uh, were con connected through the uh, higher centres. They knew far, far more than that. <clears throat> so, in this paper, he mentions the anterior horn cells, as we've mentioned before, receiving the impulses 
uh, from sources such as the cerebral cortex, red nucleus, medulla oblongata, the vestibular nucleus, the cerebellum, the pons, superior colliculi, and other higher centers which establish synaptic connections with anterior, anterior horn cells to organize uh, control of voluntary motion, equilibrium, postural reflexes, visual spinal reflexes, etc. And he also was aware of inhibitory as well as excitatory mechanisms and the dynamic balance of the nervous system which responds to the current internal and external environments and volition, as well as uh, stress and the uh, HPA axis. Okay, here we go. Now we want to. No. So this is uh, really just a little infographic, really. Sorry, it's a little bit blurry. That kind of happens when you transport something from Word to uh, Keynote, apparently. So we start at about one o'clock. You know, this is where the evolution process is kind of cyclical, really. You can have gravity or trauma, uh, musculoskeletal injury, or visceral. Uh, afferent input into the dorsal horn which then goes up to the cortex and the higher CNS and then that information is uh, compared and contrasted to previous experiences and the appropriate motor responses um, is then output to the anterior horn and uh, this is affected by the uh, inhibitory or excitatory pathways depending on the, the state of the individual and their uh, their anxiety state. So this goes down the descending pathways to the anterior horn and to affect the end tissues, uh, whether they're musculoskeletal or visceral. And then on to, after that, you get an, an increased action potentials at local paravertebral muscles and vasomotor effects affecting uh, visceral tissues, which is caused by the ischemia. And this then stimulates sensory fibers into the dorsal horn and then that ascends the uh, tracks into the higher CNS, and then you get the appropriate motor response out again, and, and we kind of continue that that whole that whole loop. So, so as this work progressed, this work was what Denslow called the early years, because it was kind of the early years of his uh, his research, uh, really. And uh, uh, they, they they at that point. Core and Denslow, they both stayed at Kirksville, but they kind of diverged. They, Denslow was doing one type of uh, uh, research and then Core was doing another. Uh, but the research was expanded to include studies that dealt largely with the relations between the somatic system and the vascular and autonomic systems and with certain viscera. And these, these were uh, published in this list of journals, journals here. And so as a result of this, osteopaths began to contemplate uh, the concepts of afferent bombardment uh, of the central nervous system, facilitation or sensitization, and the role of the cerebral cortex, postural equilibrium centers, bulbar centers, cutaneous receptors, and others that can maintain the hyper-irritability state of the central nervous system. Now, I'm not sure how many of these US osteopaths at that time would have been aware of Little John's assertion that uh, all disease starts from the sensory side. There we go. So this is a so Denslow in, a, in an interview in 1993 for the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association. He said the lessons that were learned in the early years are just as valid now as they were then, and the evaluation of the somatic system has been shown scientifically to add significant dimension to both diagnosis and treatment in the care of patients. However, outside the osteopathic profession. This dimension is not widely understood or utilised. The end. Thank you for listening. If you're still awake. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert. You're welcome. Yeah, that was a so nice uh, uh, lecture. Uh, incredible. Yeah, very stepathic, as you say. Uh, we, we talk a lot about uh, things nowadays that were researched so many years ago. Yeah, I'm trying to end this sharing thing. Here we go. That's it. There we go. We okay. And stop share. There we go. Really? Any? Was there any questions or that I might be able to answer or not? <laughs> no, it doesn't look like it, does it? 
No, they, 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 they will log in all the time. No, nobody left. So, yeah. Okay. But, but yeah, uh, they were asking if, if we could have the, the presentation uh, just to, to go through because there was so much uh, written. Maybe you, you could pass on the, the presentation. Yeah, I don't mind people having the, uh, the the keynote presentation. We can we can do that. That's no problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't I don't mind doing that. Yeah, that's very good. Where um, where, 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 where will where will we put that so people can use it? We'll, we'll uh, we we can send it to to the people who took part in the webinar, maybe. Okay, Sean just John Sean Sean has just said uh, you can send we can send it to her. And yes, uh, so that's people right. can ask that's Sean right. and then you can send it to them. That's right, yeah. So we'll do it. Ben, have you got a question? From Alessia Gessa to everyone, thank you for that. Much appreciated. Oh, thank you, Alessia. <clears throat> I hope I didn't speak to you fast English for any uh, <laughs> non English speakers. I tried to slow down, but I wanted to make sure it fitted with pretty much within the hour. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed that time. <clears throat> this this information is all freely available as well. You know, this is I haven't got this from any particularly rare source. The only thing that was actually difficult to find was the information about why Core ended up at Kirksville. And I'd wondered that for several years, and I just thought, well, I'll ask Jason Haxton, you know, and he, he knows about these things. But the other, the other information is in um, the collected papers of uh, Erwin Kaur, and, and also uh, um, the Denslow, there was uh, a book which had all Denslow's papers in, and uh, that it, it's freely available for people to read. But I think that, you know, that last paper, The Neural Basis of the Osteopathic Lesion, is such an important paper uh, for, for people to read. And uh, it's, it's like we're sort of going around in circles now, really, with uh, um, people wanting to dump the um, biomechanical uh, stuff that we do, which is such an important tool uh, that, that we use in osteopathy, and, and start using all sorts of other uh, peculiar uh, peculiar things, you know. Uh, um, and, and and we do have to consider the proximate principles, as I think still called them. Um, you know, looking at people's home stresses and, and looking at what they're eating, you know, looking at their lifestyle stuff and, and that kind of stuff. Otherwise, we are ignoring um, uh, lots of it. That's such a big part of, of osteopathy. Yeah, that's right, yeah. You have a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know if you can read them from Ben. Okay, okay, let's have a look. Uh, ben, yeah, what's your take on common criticisms of the court apart from not reading? Okay, well, the, the most common criticisms I've heard of Core are, uh, well, he didn't, as I mentioned, was as I didn't, uh, that he didn't consider anything um, apart from the dorsal horn. And, and as you could see, you know, if, you, if, if anyone had read uh, that paper, which is this this 1947, the neural basis of the osteopathic lesion, which is his kind of seminal paper. If anyone had read that, they would see quite clearly that they they were aware of that. They they, they didn't have functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging, as I said, but functional magnetic re functional magnetic resonance imaging has its problems too. You know, there were some software problems, which was uh, they talked about that making um, nearly all the uh, uh, or very large percentage of the research done with it um, flawed. Uh, and also, it can only see um, activity in large, highly myelinated fibres of the central nervous system. In other words, the brain it can't see it can't see anything that's getting to it. So it's it's a uh, um, in a if you have a lesion which is a persistent state, you have sensitization of all that neural tissue from the uh, the peripheral uh, nervous system into the cord up to the uh, higher centers, throughout the higher centers. They can see that with their functional MRI and then they can't see anything else. So they assume it's just that one area. You know, So you're, you're still getting the output. 
from that area, which is and the input in that area to maintain it. And the only way we can treat um, things in people's brain is through afferent stimulus. And that afferent stimulus isn't only um, biomechanical treatment like body adjustment, which is a really useful tool for stim stimulating. Because everything we do. Um, it stimulates or causes a reaction in the central nervous system, so we have to have to consider that. But we also have to consider people's mental states and their environment, their food, and are they hydrated and that sort of thing as well, and all those other things that may have a knock-on effect to, uh, to their central nervous system. And people thought that Core didn't consider this, and, and he quite clearly did. He's he's, he's uh, mentioned what people would call the biopsychosocial approach. Um, in 1947, which the biopsychosocial approach, I think, was supposed to be coined in the 1980s, and quite clearly, it was it wasn't new there. It wasn't new in 1947. <clears throat> uh, okay, what, what else is there? Chris, 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 Have you ever heard? <coughs> most didn't believe the osteopathic claims before getting involved. Most, have you ever heard? No, more didn't believe. Oh, Cor didn't believe. Well, didn't, yeah. um, no, I haven't. I hadn't heard that, but uh, um, that's quite likely. And, and uh, certainly, there were a lot of osteopaths or, or medics who got involved with osteopathy, wanting to disprove it. I hadn't heard Cor say that. Some of the information I got about Cor was from uh, an interview which he did with Harold Clug for the European School of Osteopathy. I think back in the late 1980s, which uh, Jason Haxton uh, sent to me. And it, that he didn't mention that. He mentioned a lot of his previous background. Uh, his parents wanted him to study medicine. He didn't want to be a doctor and that kind of thing. But he didn't mention uh, that he didn't... Uh, he didn't... Uh, um, uh, uh, believe in osteopathy uh, b before that. Um, so, but I, I have heard people say that he was embarrassed by his earlier research when he was interviewed in the 1990s. And, uh, you know, if, if, if someone showed me work that I'd written 25 years ago, I'd probably be a little bit embarrassed of it. But if, if you look at the work, it's, it's brilliant and it's still very valid. You know, biology and physiology doesn't change. It's just our understanding of it improves. But, the, you know, if you, you could, if you had the expertise in both being an osteopath and the research techniques, you could repeat this. Much like much like Burns's research, which was shown to be repeatable. <clears throat> All right. Anything yeah. else? Rant yeah. over? <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. It's uh, quarter past. So very good. I, I think that that was a brilliant remark uh, of the osteopathic lesion not being the the only thing that creates a disease. Mm. And I think that some people claim, you know, especially for classical osteopaths, oh, you do, uh, you know, all this bone adjustment and and that's all. And I think we have to remark, you know, it's not bone adjustment; it's body adjustment. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, very, very true. You know, it's. Uh, in Little John's Principles of Osteopathy, you know, he, he talks about uh, uh, Andrew Taylor Still's um, claim that all, all uh, disease starts from uh, a bone out of place, which was, I think that was quite an early claim by Still, and then he developed upon that and realised that wasn't quite the case. Um, you know, Little John uh, uh, denied that vehemently, and I, and I, and I think this is quite possibly going back to one of the reasons why uh, they uh, probably had their, um, uh, they probably parted their ways, you know. Uh, uh, they, they obviously had some disagreement in, in around the beginning of the 20th century, but that certainly wasn't um, something which was carried forward because Little John was part of the AT Steel Research uh, Institute and he wrote for them and that was, uh, you know, a thing which is, was funded and organised from Kirksville. So if they had any malice uh, to Little John or the Little John Brothers, it was certainly had been put aside uh, by then. I think uh, you know the, the things they talked about uh, back in back in those days had, had been had been put aside. Uh, but uh, Little Little John really put sort of meat on the bones for for uh, for want of a better expression.
dipped it in physiology and kept it there. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everyone. If we don't have any more questions, uh, we will say goodbye. Uh, thank you to, to Robert. You are a, such an, an amazing guy with a fountain of uh, knowledge of osteopathy. Thank you to Pindi Osteol for allowing us this platform to be used. Thank and you, just, Pindi. Yeah, uh, just uh, remind everyone that next month we have uh, Mervyn uh, talking about the pelvis and obviously the the year conference of the ICO with more staff and more speakers around and workshops. So I hope to see you all there. Okay, guys, so good night and uh, have a nice weekend. Thanks very much. Good night. All right.